Okay, welcome back to the latest episode of the Sports Coaching Podcast with me, Sam Elmshaw. We are already on to uh, episode two of this brand new season, season four, which is uh, time flies going, going really well so far. And I am very privileged to welcome a, a, a smashing chat. We've had a, a bit of a, a brief conversation on LinkedIn. He's doing some fantastic work and I'm really happy to have him on the podcast this morning. Mr. Lawrence Mead. Lawrence, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm not bad. Thanks, Sam, for having me on. It's really great to be here. How are you? Yeah, it's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not too bad. Uh, <laughs> I know we've, uh, we've just briefly spoke about on air about our uh, current situations and how we're doing. But yeah. uh, for everyone listening, let me ask you, how's, uh, how's life been during this uh, strange coronavirus period? You managed to uh, to keep occupied, keep busy, keep sane, should we say? Yeah, keep keeping busy. Bored of looking at a screen, I think, is the way to put it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This year, I was, I was saying to you, the second one's been a lot tougher. The first one, it was all sort of new, fresh, exciting a different sort of period especially for coaching and now it's just sort of mid-season and waiting to get back out there and and get get all these ideas out um but it's it's all right it's it's, it could be worse it could be better but i think lots of others are in worse situations which is probably something to be grateful for that i can still do work and have a nice place to stay and go on walks and be with family so can't complain too much just waiting for it to end and waiting to go and play some hockey coaching hockey (laughs) i can imagine but really positive spin on that so that's great to hear uh, so yeah, you know, you mentioned hockey. I think it's a a, a good time to ask you, obviously, to uh, give a bit of an introduction, if you don't mind, Lawrence, about yourself, your coaching background, even you know your playing background in sports, and and I guess what's led you to uh, where you are today, you know, coming onto this podcast. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So I've been coaching probably now for about it's coming up to six six years. Uh, so I started around when I was fourteen, fifteen, but in I, I almost see it as two very different phases of my coaching. The first three years were very much much sort of just helping out, not really seeing it as anything, just helping out, volunteering, doing some club stuff, doing some county stuff. And then sort of the second three years of actually really getting getting stuck in. And I guess the big part for me was finishing my A-levels three years ago. Uh, so I was always sort of meant to go to university, meant to. Um, so I was lined up to go to Nottingham and study law for some reason, probably because university was the only route that was ever spoken about. Um, I don't disagree with that. I just think sometimes people need different times. Um, and then sort of June time, I decided that I wanted to take a year out. Didn't have a clue what I was going to do. Uh, and then a job came up at Seven Oaks School down in Kent um, for sort of like a sports coach graduate to work in the P department. Uh, and I applied and I was really, really fortunate to go to Seven Oaks for a year and work with some really, really great people who sort of started me off on a coaching journey. Um I sort of just working, going straight from being in school to working in a school was a massive change and sort of a bit of a shock being on the other side. Um, but it was it was really great and sort of through there led to a few other opportunities working at Wimbledon Hockey Club with, with again, some great people. And then I sort of sat at the end of that year and thought, what on earth am I doing with my life? And realised that uh, coaching was something that I really wanted to get into and I sort of never considered it before until that first year. And then I moved down to a school in Dorset called Branston. So coming up to 18 months there. Uh, which has been a, which has been a great place. Some really, really, really awesome guys down there um, that have just challenged me in a different way and sort of made me think so in depth about my coaching. And through working at the school, it's just led to some really awesome opportunities down at Bournemouth Hockey Club. Uh, you know, I've been able to really implement a program. Adam Tapper down there, the director of hockey, is just so I'm really awesome. We share a lot of the same values, so it's been really great to do that and work from under tens right up to the men's section. Just sort of see the whole flow of the club and sort of. De- develop and implement a plan to go forward uh and then i did some county stuff last year with dorset um which was cool i've sort of always been engaged in the pathway and i've, I've liked the idea of the pathway uh, and then this year getting into sort of regional coaching at performance center down in taunton which has just been hasn't happened a lot but it's what has happened has been really awesome um and it's been a great great sort of experience working at that sort of a different level and i think the the thing for me is that i'm so grateful for is having that experience of working in these different environments, whether it be like a school, a club, a pathway, and then sort of all the camp stuff with, with future sports and sports ways. There's some really, really decent stuff and just a lot of hands-on experience at the moment. And then in the last year, sort of tried to shape more about my coaching and where where I want to go and the values that are important to me as a coach, which has sort of led to doing a lot of a lot of research, um, a lot of writing, which I've really enjoyed and sort of making me see coaching a bit differently. I think coaching... I often saw, and I think it's often perceived as just sport. I think it's a, a much bigger than that in terms of developing people and working with people. And, you know, it's something I'm, I love and I'm hoping to go on and sort of educate further in it as and when the right moment comes, but just enjoying coaching and 
missing it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I certainly, uh, certainly resonate with you there about missing coaching. But yeah, some uh, fan- fantastic experience, wealth of experience. Really interesting to uh, to hear your background. Uh, t- tell us a bit about the difference in between, you know, coaching in, in schools. And I think down in the South, particularly with sports such as hockey, there's some really great structures, you know, coaching hockey to, to youngsters in school coming through that you don't really tend to see that as much up here in the North. But tell us tell us a bit more about that and tell us how that context might be different to actually working in a club outside of schools. That's something that always, you know, interests me personally. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's actually more challenging than a lot of people let on. You know, going from school coaching in the afternoon down to a club context with the men, you know, we're in two different contexts. And I think it's, I, I've often struggled with the word philosophy because I think it's very context dependent, a philosophy. Um, and I think my philosophy in school won't be my same philosophy at club, but my values will probably be be the same. Uh, school is, is, is really development for me. You know, we don't, we don't focus on anything but development and sort of the season just well the season just gone showed that because we're not playing any matches we were really focused on development and it's a whole different environment because the the motivation behind the kids is often very different because it's sort of a have to rather than I want to whereas at club and pathway you get the kids that actually want you know they want to be there because it's, it's extra um so I think the environments we create at school are, are very very different um and also we get to see a lot of different things at school working with from like the first team down to sort of the new year nines that come in and have varying experiences of hockey it's mm. is challenging because you you and i think it's something that i've learned is that you have to really think about the session designs we plan in school and how do they suit the needs of of the students yeah. whereas a club you can get to know them a, a lot better and the, the relationships you form in a club are different to schools just because of the nature of where you're at um and I, i've really enjoyed both in fact so i i got yeah i won't say anything against it because i think they i think it's a great opportunity in schools and i think it's something that School hockey is and school sport is really really grown and show showcasing some really good stuff. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I think you know sometimes people don't realise. Uh, I suppose non coaches when they listen to this podcast actually how much the context you know determines uh, how you go and coach, you practice your behaviours, uh, you practice structure design and all these you know things we associate with uh, you know actually doing our job. And, you know, I, I certainly resonate with you there. I think with philosophy, that's certainly something I've, you know, even still do feel now, I think to myself, you know, would my philosophy change if, if I was to go back to coaching youngsters or would I keep those same values and principles? So, yeah, sounds like we're on the right lines, which is, uh, which is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Uh, yeah, and no, I, I suppose just to, uh, to finish off about yourself, tell us about your current role with uh, England and Great Britain Hockey. I believe you're a performance centre coach, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's been... It started in September, but as I said, it hasn't happened much, but it's been, it's been really cool because, you know, at 20, I didn't think I'd be, you know, at coaching at this level, but um, it's such a different structure because contact time is, is so low. You know, we see every two weeks or for two hours and then we go off um, and then we go off to cluster days and et cetera. But it's, it's a really, really challenging context because the players there, their motivations are very different because they know they're at a certain level. But at the same time, with such low contact time, we're trying to cram a lot in to, to get that development cycle going. Um, but we do, you know, there's, there's, I work with three really top coaches down there who are really engaged and great to learn from. Uh, and I, I like the pathway at the moment. I know it's changing, England and hockey are changing the whole pathway, but I, I think a lot of people say a lot of bad things, but I think there are a lot of positives from what I've seen. Um, and I think the change will hopefully be a positive, um, a, a high pressure environment, I'd say, you know, because you know that they want to do well. Uh, and it's it's very. I remember my first first session, um, someone coming up to me and just uh, like asking questions, just engaging, being like, "How can I do this? How can I do that?" And just the change from the context again is so different because at school sometimes it's like, "Come on, I'm I'm going to try and get you to do this," versus how 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 can I do this? Um, and it's it's stretched me a lot as a coach. You know, we're starting some virtual stuff with them in in the next couple of weeks, which will be really interesting to see sort of how that takes shape um, compared to club and school. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty fortunate, pretty fortunate to be working with, with the performance centers. Um, you know, it's, it's a really great opportunity and it's thanks to a lot of people who have supported me for a long time. Fantastic. And I, and I suppose the final question to you is, you know, uh, very, very much involved in hockey. Have you, you know, always been a hockey player? Did you come up playing hockey, uh, involvement in any other sports? And I suppose, did that lead you to, to become a hockey coach or, you know, what, what was your, your pathway there? Yes, yeah, so I grew up playing 
I grew up, did a lot of things. Tennis was actually my main sport probably up until about 12. I played a lot, a lot of tennis. And I, me and my brother used to play. He was always much better than me, but never mind. Um, but yeah, I played tennis and then sort of through school and sort of year seven, eight, I started playing hockey and was all right. Enjoyed it, played at Clifton Robinson's, um, did some pathway stuff. And then I, I, I don't know what happened. I just, I think coaching is very different to playing. Um, and just with injuries and that, when I took a bit of time out to think about it, you know, I think I still enjoy playing socially. I think it's a really great thing to still play and coach. Um, but coaching always just naturally sort of suited me, I think, because that is a good question. Why it suited me, I'm not sure. I think I'm, that is something that I'm still discovering. Um, but I think playing, did, doing a lot of things as a youngster, I was pretty fortunate that my parents basically got me involved in everything. Um, and I just, I got to experience a lot. And tennis was was a really different sport for me because it's it's a very individual um and you're out there you're out there on your own playing matches and you feel a, a little bit lonely at times not yeah, yeah, yeah. lonely I'm gonna go with and um compared to then going into a team environment with hockey um I think it really represented to me as a coach the need for support supporting athletes and young athletes especially because even in a team game people can still feel alone isolated um and yeah I I still play a bit of tennis I still play a little bit of tennis, but yeah, tennis and hockey and then sort of just shaped naturally into coaching. I guess it sort of just flowed and then haven't looked back. Fantastic. I mean, I certainly resonate with you there as well. I started as a swimmer, very individual sport, moved into football about 12 myself. So, you know, I certainly know what you're saying there yeah. in terms of, you know, at times feeling lonely and, and not always having like a teammate to actually talk to because you know when you're swimming everyone's your competitor and I, I you know presume the same in tennis as well so so yeah fascinating thank you uh thank you very much for sharing your journey uh Lawrence certainly uh, a wealth of experience at such a young age at 20 so that's fantastic uh so yeah leads us on very nicely to today's topic and, I, and I've got to say personally I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one so we decided our topic today was going to be risk versus reward and how can we begin to implement this into practice design so I think risk versus reward is a concept that, you know, I think people have a bit of an idea of what it's about. Some coaches more than others. Um, I would question if everyone, you know, truly knows the concept behind it and where that kind of comes in, in into where, uh, you know, in terms of team sports, particularly. So I suppose the first question, Lawrence, and or the first question for you, if we think about, you know, for the layperson coach or the layperson listener who isn't really familiar with this term and what it means, um, well, what does risk versus reward mean? And, and what's that got to do with, you know, with sport? Yeah, sure. I'll sort of, I'll talk about the what, and then I'm sure we'll go on to sort of the, the why and considerations later. Um, the idea is basically like in any sport, if we think about a player on and off the ball, every single changing dynamic in play, they're faced with an assessment of the environment and they have to make a decision accordingly. Um, even when you're on the ball, when you're off the ball. And the idea is that every action has a risk. Maybe it might be higher, maybe it might be lower. And every action has a reward. Again, it might be higher or lower. And it's sort of thinking about how we can start replicating this in our practice to help players make better decisions. And the thing that I'm a big fan of is because it's not us at all telling them what to do. We're not saying make this decision. It's us manipulating constraints and using the risks and rewards to sort of see the behaviours that we want to see um so the idea you know if we take take any any invasion game you could make a, a really long pass that's going through a congested area that's a high risk pass we could say but it's probably a high reward because we're closer to our goal our, we're closer to the opposition's goal or we can make a, a low risk pass which is a shorter ball to hold possession um and i think it's it's quite a complex topic when you actually think in depth about it because there are so many different constructs that might affect a player's decision making depending on the game the score, the time, how tired they are. Um, and it's sort of how we can start to replicate that in practice design. I think, it, you know, it's been fascinating for me to sort of implement in my coaching and research because I think often it's something that coaches don't, don't think about. Um, and I'll touch, I'll touch briefly on the word risk because I think it's also a, a tricky word. For me, there's a big difference between risk and uncertainty. And the way I see it is that risk is when you're aware of the, some of the possible outcomes or why there is a risk. Uncertainty is when you don't know the outcome. So the way I see it is that uncertainty is us sort of giving players an experience to learn the risks and then they're more aware of the outcomes, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 certainly it does. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with, with that. I think that's a great introduction to the topic. And I think it's certainly something that um, not a lot of coaches, from my experience as a player and also as a coach working with coaches, ever really, you know, look into or go into. I think sometimes the risk versus reward idea is, is associated with, you know, sports like darts or, you know, focus sports where you, you are really tending. But people forget that actually we can incorporate that into team sports, into net and wall sports, uh, you know, into target sports and, and all these other sports. And, you know, I think people forget it's actually quite a core concept, like you say. And, you know, I think about myself as a player, uh, we were never about taking risks when I played. It was all about the safe pass or, or the safe option. And, and you sort of look back now and you think, well, why? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. 14, 15 years old, why were we not encouraged to, to take risks and, and you know, really go and enjoy ourselves? And, and, you know, for me in that context, it was all about, you know, even at 14 and everything was about winning. And if you didn't win, you yeah. get the telling off at the end of the game. So you were scared to do it. So, you know, I think, you know, just following that on a, a, as the question, why is it important, it's, you know, particularly in youth development, that we are encouraging players to, you know, think about risk reward situations and actually, you know, promoting the idea of, of taking risks, uh, you know, when they're playing games? I think it's, I think it's really important because I think, as you say, often we, we look to be, like, often I see coaches saying, like, we're going to be safe, we just want to keep possession. But ultimately, when we look at top-level sport, that's, that's not the case because every, you know, certain individuals are more risk-leading, risk-averse. Um, and I don't think often we account for that, Um one thing that I last year that someone that I learned on a uh, sort of a course that I was doing with the FIH from Darren Cheeseman was this idea of wrong versus different. And I really like this analogy because it's, it's basically saying that I think a lot of coaches see things at cert, especially at certain ages, as there are certain things that shouldn't be done, but often players are becoming, especially after lockdown, they're becoming more, they focus a lot on skills. So they're becoming more skillful and, the idea that they need to try these out and try different things is is really important. Like I remember down at club one time at, with the under 14s, I think he's a he's 13 and he can, he can chuck a really good aerial. And he sort of, he was like, can I use it? And I was like, why, why, why wouldn't you? And he was like, because I don't know, like, am I allowed to? And I was like, it's a part of the game, isn't it? Am I allowed to? But that's actually a question that I think coaches face a lot. Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do this? And I think it really demonstrates the environments we're creating for players asking if we're allowed to do something. I think when we put constraints on things, it's a whole different, whole different thing. But he then chucked an arrow and went on to score a goal. And he was then aware of the outcome, the pot, one possible outcome of that. He did it again. He was then aware of another possible outcome, which I think is really important to let players make mistakes. And as, as cringe as it may sound, I often, I change the word mistake to an opportunity to learn. Like I'm sure like as coaches, we make mistakes. As players, you make mistakes. But actually, it's a really good opportunity to learn more about ourselves and the game when we make a mistake. Yeah. Um, and certainly, if we can create environments where they're not seen as negative, I think we're we're really saying something to the youth about, you know, it's actually all right. Everyone's going to make a mistake. Every game you're going to make a mistake. No one has a perfect game. But they need the experience. As I, was, as I mentioned before, they need the experience to find out how uncertainty turns into risk, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, certainly it does. And, and I think it... It kind of goes against that, you know, traditional uh, thinking, if you like, it, you know, in England when, you know, certainly I suppose when me and you were coming through playing, uh, I know myself, everything was about, you know, if you make a mistake, it's so negative. And, you know, as a player, you'd go home and you'd think about, I can remember having a bad game of football coming in my room and, and, and locking myself away for four hours. And, you know, even like in my early days as a coach, I, I was obsessed with the idea of, uh, you know, recycling possession. And I would always say to the players, you know, no, let's not take risks. Let's, let's recycle the ball and keep possession. But, you know, you're so right. You think about, well, you know, in terms of then in the game, and, and you know, we sort of think about the idea of, uh, you know, like ecological psychology, uh, affordances, opportunities for action, you know, different solutions a player can make. We're completely taking that out of players if we're just saying, no, look, don't do what you think. Do this lovely save option that helps. And, and I think that's a fantastic point as well. If we think about the bigger picture and, and maybe thinking about life skills and actually saying to these youngsters, well, actually, it is OK to fail. Uh, I, I absolutely love that, by the way, an opportunity to learn a mistake. I think that's brilliant. Certainly something that I think we should be you know, promoting with these youngsters, because, you know, like you say, it's important for them to have that outlook. You know, actually, you do learn from failure. And, and actually, you know, when we were, were kids, 
that was often a negative thing, but actually it's not a negative thing. Actually, it's a positive thing. It's going to help you develop as a player, surely. Uh, yeah, 100%. I've always said, especially, you know, I, I say a lot around school hockey, I think, and school sport in general, I think the best thing for happiness for players to experience losing and winning. Mm. Because I think it is is the best best thing when you, you experience the feeling of winning, you experience the feeling of losing, you know what they both feel like. And you then you have something to go off and you have you have that sort of emotional involvement in a game, which I think is is really important. Um, and yeah, I just I think coaching is I think is you probably agree, coaching is moving into sort of a different it's it's moving forward a lot. And I think this idea that there is a set way to do something is 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 really not not a thing anymore. I think there is a lot of different ways to do things. And I think I often reflect on it a lot as how I might see a decision is completely different to how a young athlete might see a decision. Yeah. And it's really important that then actually I go and understand why they're making that decision. Because if I, if I think, I never think a decision is wrong because I don't, I don't think there is such thing as a wrong decision. I think there are better decisions and not yeah. as good decisions, Yeah. but ultimately they need to make both like they need to win and lose. They need to make good decisions. They need to make bad decisions. They need to learn the consequences. And I guess the risks of the decisions they make. And I just, yeah, especially when I was growing up, I just, you know, it was a lot win focused. It was a lot of don't do this, don't do that. You know, if we're telling someone to not do that, what we actually, what we actually saying to the players, you know, if you're, we're saying don't do that, are we actually encouraging them to go on and experience different things? Probably not. You know, I often think at high level, are they telling players don't do something in the context of training? Probably not. Maybe in matches, we might, we might see it a bit different because we're sort of, we're in the game and it's context specific and we can really think about, you know, I want to do, I want to achieve this in this game. But in training, I think it is so important that players experiences those, those kind of, the kind of things that they wouldn't, they wouldn't try in a game, that they wouldn't be brave enough to try in a game. I often go, well, why don't we try in training? And then you can see how it, how it pans out. Yeah. If you don't try something in training, the likelihood is when you try in a game, it's probably not going to pay off. If you try in training, you're aware of the outcomes of how it might look. Yes. You're going to probably be a lot more successful in, in a game. And I think, I, just, I think personally, it's, it's really important. I don't think, you know, we'll go on to practice tonight. I don't think it is the one, I don't think it should be overused at all, uh, the sort of idea of how we implement it into practice. But I think we should always consider that every decision a player makes, they're going to be considering risks and rewards and the different types of decisions they make and why they make those decisions. The why for me is really important about sort of everything in my coaching. It's the why. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 100 percent agree with every point you've made there and and I think that point of, of talking about uh you know sorry the point you made about you know the perspective of of you as the coach and and you know thinking differently to how a player might think I think that's a fantastic and and sometimes such a misunderstood point at times that I don't think a lot of coaches realize uh, but, you know sometimes I think as the coach we kind of or traditionally would have felt that we see everything our vision is correct our perception of the game is correct and we're the most knowledgeable person there and therefore uh, you know if those players don't make a decision that's right in in our mind that's incorrect and I think 100% like you say we are moving away from that uh, traditional you know dualistic sort of uh, right or wrong way of doing things now we're actually more open to different concepts but I think you know to me that that really does represent the importance of uh, recognizing you know what your player might perceive and and recognizing that, like you say, they might see it differently, and you know, because at the end of the day, how they play is some of their experiences. And actually, like you say, we shouldn't be, uh, you know, not promoting that just because it's yeah. not how we see. It. I think that's such a such an important point. And and actually, you know, going back to your point of, you know, players understanding how to, uh, you know, deal with you know, failing and, and not always winning. And, and again, you know, and I, I go back to the point of, I don't know about hockey, but in football, everything at the minute is, is all about making uh, creative players, creativity, you know, that seems to be the trend at the minute. But, you know, when I speak to a lot of coaches, we're not allowing players to be creative and go and do them, uh, you know, take them risks and explore and, and, you know, and all those sort of words that we associate. And I think, you know, again, for me, that just really summarises why we've got to really, you know, forget about the decision-making point of view of, of, of risk-reward calculations, but also just the idea of just, just letting them take risks and letting them explore and, like you say, letting them make mistakes. You know, to me, that's just ridiculously important, isn't it? It, it, seems, it seems so na so natural. I remember sort of the first, the first session back when, when was it in September when we actually fully came back with some of the boys at club my first session was just sh show me what you did over lockdown show me what skills you learned over lockdown because 
that's the one thing, the one positive, I think, well, there, there are a few, but one main positive that came out is that creativity became quite cool because they had to be creative. And I, I don't do a lot of structured club sessions because I think that they need time away from their screens. But I also think it's a really good opportunity for them to develop on their own and be self-independent. Yeah. I'm big on this whole idea of, you know, emotional intelligence and coaching, both as a coach and as players yeah. and empathy based coaching, where we can understand what the, what the player wants and how the player feels. And we can start to understand them a little bit better. And same with the players, you know, I think I, met, I touched on it earlier. I think through sort of employing a, an environment where mistakes are seen as a good thing, where you can be creative, we're setting them up for, for better things in later life when they're they're not afraid where they don't do everything by the book when they're not conservative we're making we're making players feel more confident in the, the decisions they're going to make in in life and i think that's you know that's something as i said earlier that struck me in coaching is that it's so much more about just actually actual sport i often actually think the more i coach the, the less i think it's about sport and the more i think it is about people and like yeah. i'm big on this whole person-centered instead of a yeah. player-centered yeah. because i think a player-centered sort of indicates that we're just worried about them as a player when they're on the sports pitch. A yeah. person-centered implies that actually we're worried about or with considering all the things that are going on in their life and how it might affect them. Yeah. And I think, it, I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard because, you know, when you're, I see some coaches that are training 35 on their own and it's like, this is, it must be tough because you can't have that. You don't have as much individual time. One thing that I, I sort of did a year or two ago was every, so there was sort of about 16 girls in the squad and I just dedicated a week to two of them if that makes sense not where it would just be solely focused on them but I'd make extra effort to to ask them questions around sport around life and just by the end of it you've just got a whole better picture of your athletes and I think it's it's really important I've I've found certainly I'm not sure if you agree that we as coaches often get drawn to the players that are more confident in themselves yeah not the players who are not as confident and yeah. this is this is why i think the risk reward is really important because i think we can we can strengthen coach athlete relationships you know if we've got a slight shy individual i remember at school week we had a girl who's a really good player but just a little shy so I, we said one session every touch on the ball you get a point mm. so they're more willing to get involved and not necessarily even take a risk but more willing to build that confidence yeah. um and that's what i love about this approach is it can be done individually it can be on a team basis and we can really target the areas to advance sort of principles, objectives, aims, techniques. Um, I just, yeah, I'm a big fan of it. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, you know, such a fantastic uh, outlay, actually. You know, I think, uh, you know, sometimes when we sort of think about risk reward, we only, like you say, think about things in sport and how does it benefit in sport. And actually, when we're thinking about this bigger picture and, and you know, like you say, I, certainly part of my philosophy as well, person-centred, uh, you know, traditionally, we'd always think about, you know, just the player on the pitch and kind of forget that there's a person behind that player. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff they're doing outside of the sport. This isn't their life. Uh, you know, we, we're very guilty of, uh, you know, thinking like that traditionally coaches. But but absolutely, I, I, I think it, it really justifies uh, why we need to allow this this risk taking behavior in sessions. Yeah. Come through. So, so, yeah, fantastic, fantastic outlay. So I think that. That leads us on very nicely then to uh, to moving into our next segment. Uh, so, you know, I suppose to, to pose the question to you, Lovins, uh, and, and I know we've, we've very briefly just, just spoke about it there, but, you know, how do we uh, begin to encourage this risk-taking behaviour or idea of, of allowing players to, to make risk-reward calculations? How do we encourage that in practice? What, what would we, you know, for the coach, listen, where would they start? What, what, what might they start thinking about to, to implement that into their practice to allow this with their players? I think something that, that I think a lot about for the risk is making sure the risk has a value. So I, I begin to value, value actions, um, especially when you shape it around what you're doing. So if we can start valuing actions or behavior, they get a high risk. They're going to be more inclined. Mm. And the key point is often we think that this is something that I've thought about recently is that often we think that the high reward should be associated with the high risk, but there are also times where we're actually going to associate a high reward with a lower risk because that's our objective in that session. One sort of, I'll briefly explain it because it won't make I hope it makes sense when I'm speaking. One exercise that I like to that sort of demonstrates this sort of risk reward. So it's a six V six in, in a box and you've got two players from either side on one edge of the box. And basically the team on the ball is just trying to get the, the ball from one player on one edge to the other player on the other edge. We can then put a risk or reward saying by, if you make that pass in 
one pass so that longer distance pass it's going to be through congested say we're looking at moving to go moving the ball to go forward is our objective you're mm. going to get five points if you go through the people in the middle to the other side you're going to get one point we're then asking a different question of every single player in that practice because the pe- the person on the ball is thinking how can i make their first thought is how can i make that high reward pass the people off the ball, so say the team on the ball that are in the box, if that makes sense, they're thinking, how can I create space to allow the longer pass? Or am I going to actually offer the shorter pass and play it safer? Mm. Um, Defensively, because then we we can flip it both on defence. Defensively, they're thinking, do I block the longer pass of five points but allow space for someone else? Or do I man mark, say, and make sure it can't get to anyone? Or can we do both? And this is what I love about it is you can get some really good conversations going around it. When players are actually, th- they, they, they have to think in depth about their behaviours. They're thinking, what impact is this going to have? Um, and then that, you know, that activity can go on to different things. Sometimes I do it that the other team get a higher point for going through the middle and a lower point for passing direct. And you just sort of see the different types of behaviours. Yeah. The key for me is that we shape it around the principle or objective of our session. So say if that was a moving the ball to go forward, why do we want to see, why is that pass Kyra higher reward and higher risk and value that um i'll mention the consideration that i think is the biggest one here is that the difference between the rewards is definitely going to shape the behavior i if action one has a reward of one point action two has a reward of two points there's not a lot of difference in there to a player mm. if action one is one point action two is 10 points that's a big difference especially in use when rewards are so valued yeah it, we, like it's something that we've got to consider. So I start thinking about how important is this behavior as a whole or in this session? And then I can start to piece together. And I, I think I've, it's got to a point where I really think carefully about how much actually the number, the, the size of the reward is. Mm. And I think often from what I've seen in coaching, we just put a number on things and don't think about the why. We just put a number on something and just say, yeah, that's worth X amount of points. But yeah. why is it worth? Yeah. Because to players, it means players' rewards mean something, but why is a certain action worth this many points? Yeah. And if they understand the why, then we can start to start to encourage it. And the you know, this is the thing I love about this approach is they've got the numerous decisions, so they've got the option to take that risk at the right time. But when you first do it, they're gonna be like, right, how they're uncertain about how it might work. But as you let a practice go on, we're starting to see behaviors where we say actually. They're more risk-taking now because they can see different changes. I can see that player's making a run somewhere that's opening up space, so I can make a more risky action that's going to get me a high reward. Yeah. But then they also know when not to. And I think it's when we then transfer into a game, we can see it, we can see it massively. Um, I hope that I hope that explanation makes sense. It's oh, always hard. Does. It's always hard to describe a practice without <laughs> without sort of drawing it out. No, I think you did uh, I think you did a great job there. It certainly made a load of sense to me. Uh, I, I think that's a such a such a great point that that we often don't even think about. I've certainly been guilty of it myself so many times. You know, thinking about coaching youngsters and saying, right, you know, if you do this, you get one goal. But if you do this, it counts for two. Well, you're so right. You know, the players there, are like, well, you know, I'll just score two goals that way instead and get the same amount. That is that that is such a important you know thing to think about, and I think that really does demonstrate why like you say, we really do have to think about what is that reward, you know, and whether that's, you know, making it, uh, you know, similar to like a, a game scenario of, you know, if you do this, then the reward will be this. If you do this, the reward will be this. But like you say, we really do have to think about that because if we are trying to manipulate how one acts, if we're trying to manipulate that player's behaviours, then, you know, we've actually got a beyond the wavelength and, and you know sort of going back to your you know idea of motivation as well well you know what is going to encourage him to take more risks uh, I, I think that is such an important consideration actually that again I don't think a lot of people often think about I certainly haven't thought too much about that so I've certainly learned something there uh, and you, you know I guess this really uh, you know as we were speaking off air before really links into the idea of the constraints led approach doesn't it thinking about the constraints you're implementing uh, you know how are you manipulating there so you know i suppose for the listener who, who might not be uh, too aware of the idea of constraints you want to just give a bit of a, a brief overview of, of what those uh, academic terms mean should we say sometimes i, I just call them rules <laughs> yeah it's it's i'm you know i really like a, a constraints that approach um there's a really good book on it as well which i read a lot um 
basically a constraint is when we manipulate behavior by saying that a player can or can't do something. Um, I think the key point is the difference between over constraining and saying, so for example, a constraint might be you only have three touches. You can only make three touches on the ball. That is a constraint. The way I, the way I sometimes see it is, is that actually over constraining? So actually, again, if we say you get a point, if you make three touches, they might be, they're going to be more inclined to do that behavior, but they don't have to. And I think that is when a constraints and approach really shapes when they don't have to do it, but they have the option to, and then they have to have the confidence and the self-belief to make those decisions. I think there is a time for over constraining as well. I think there can be when we're really trying to hone in on a, on a certain tech technique. You know, if we focus solely on something, we might just put a constraint on that. Um, but I, I use it a lot and there's a, there's a really good, I don't know if you've seen that sort of environment design continuum where it sort of talks about isolated to small macro game, small sided games to a macro game. I really like that sort of progression within it. Um, I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert on constraints and approach at all, but I think it's a really interesting, a really interesting thing. And, you know, the big thing I consider with a constraints that approach is the, the priming of a constraint. Yeah. So I think about it in the risk reward and in the constraints. Do I, what's the difference if I tell a player, this is why a constraint is in place versus what's the difference if I don't tell a player. So if I told a player, this action is worth high reward because of this, 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 versus if I didn't tell them and then actually went, why do you think that's high? I think there's a really, really big difference. I don't think there's a, I don't think we should always prime and I don't think we should always not prime. I think there's a time and place when we should yeah. give information about the constraints and how it fits into the bigger picture yeah. or let players discover through playing in the constraint and see what, see what they think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big believer in constraints. And I think it, the best thing for me is that we can, as a coach is, you know, no coaches will say that they like telling you need to do this, do this, 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 this. But instead we are sort of doing that in a way just through manipulating their behavior through the constraints yeah. that approach. And I think that is, that is a really good thing. Cause it's not someone, you know, everyone says it, everyone says it in life. You don't like when someone tells you to do something, yeah. but actually when you, when someone manipulates your behavior to do something, yeah. you're more inclined to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Some, some great points again. Uh, you know, you're so right. I, th I think we we often see that in football, uh, one touch, two touch, we encourage that play to get the more ball moving quickly. But then what we forget is that that actually uh, can be over constrained if we do it too much because it, you know, removes dribbling, for example. We, we, we're stopping players, uh, you know, trying to manipulate the ball themselves, but we're, we're encouraging them to get out of defeat. So such a such a great point there. And, and again, really, you know, as you were saying before, highlights why we need to think about, well, what is the reward that we're looking for him to get what what is what are the sort of risks we're, which we're trying to uh, manipulate here we're trying to encourage those those players to uh, to perform and, and and i think that's a great point as well you know sort of thinking about the bigger picture we have a, a saying on our on our master's course at leeds beckett we, we always say start with the end in mind um, yeah. and, and again i think that's that's probably something that a lot of coaches are guilty of we don't always uh, think one, two, three, four years ahead, thinking about, you know, encouraging these now. And if we don't see it in that session, that's, uh, you know, that's a massive problem. We've got to go and correct that. Actually, you know, if we know we've got this group for a couple of years, we can afford to allow some of these manipulations to take place. And, and you know, I think that's the important message, isn't it? You know, sometimes players won't, particularly if they've not come from a background where they've been allowed to take risks, they won't automatically do it straight away, will they? Not at all. I think your point there, I just made note of it. I don't know what, what it is about it, but I think dribbling is dribbling and carrying the ball in hockey or dribbling in football is, is something that is, is sometimes really frowned upon by coaches. I'm not sure if you agree, because I think they just, there's an idea that passing is the best thing. And I think there has to be this realization in coaching that there is a time and place for both. Yeah. And players need to know both. Players need to know what happens when you dribble half the way down the pitch and lose the ball and realize, oh, actually, if I made that pass two seconds earlier, that would have been successful. But again, there's there's the time, and you know I mentioned it earlier. Something that I think is really important in this risk reward is that the highest risk doesn't always have to be the high reward, especially when our say our objective is around retaining possession of a session. We want a higher reward for retaining possession because that's the positive behaviors we're we're reinforcing. Um, so I don't think it always has to be that the highest risk gets the highest reward. And I think the thing that I think links really nicely to this is I see a lot of sessions that are just isolated in themselves. You just do session, session, session. You're not thinking about this bigger picture. Yeah. Through this risk reward, you know, I use it in the shape that if we did something last week, 
We're going to remember that. And that's going to be our lower reward because it's not our focus this week. So you're going to get a lower reward from our focus last week. You're going to get a higher reward for our focus this week. But at least we're starting to link the two together. You know, I know you're a big fan of this. I'm a big believer that learning isn't linear. But I think a massive part of learning is getting players to group bits of information and link bits of information together. And I think often we just, we see, I see isolated sessions that aren't linking things together and aren't getting players to link bits of information together. And I think it's the, the most important thing when players can link sessions, decisions yeah. all together and start to understand, you know, the outcomes. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, that's, that's such a great point. Uh, you know, again, I, I think, you know, like you say, uh, we, we do have to think about how are these little bits of information? How are these little bits of manipulation? You know, these these practices. How are they linking in with 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 little objectives we're trying to achieve here? And and like you say, you know, you think I think about myself as a player. Um, there would often be times where you would you know work on something like maintaining possession or, or or learning how to pass, and then you would learn you know the next session something about dribbling, and then it would only be maybe two three years later you'd think, oh, that links in with what I'm doing now. Yeah. And, and that's like sort of the point you're saying now is actually we need to think about, you know, how we sort of drop in these nuggets for players to, to yeah. you know, to link on and think, oh, that links with what I've done here or what I've done there. So, so absolutely agree. And, and I think the point on, on passing is so true. I think probably in football, the influence of uh, people like Guardiola at the minute were, uh, you know, clearly in his game, the, the optimum solution to maintain possession is, you know, passing the ball over short range distances. And I think sometimes we're, we're guilty of sort of being influenced by that. And, and you're 100% right. We, you know, there didn't have to be an optimum solution, uh, particularly in youth development. We, we, we can, you know, allow players to explore and take these risks. And, and I think a probably important word to get in here, Lawrence, for, for the listener is is uh, the idea of, of context specific. So, you know, some of these ideas, or, or sorry, some of the ways we implement these ideas will be completely different to how we do in one context to another. So I, th- I think probably a word of, of why is it important for us to understand the context and, and make what we are doing as appropriate as possible to the context, the age and stage, uh, you know, the ability of the players, you know, like you mentioned before, motivation, why they're there. Uh, you know, why is that important that we really consider that? I think it is it's because it means things to different players. You know, working with adults, this isn't an approach I actually use that much because I know that they don't, there's certain things and I really think about when I shape it around using it with adults versus children. I think it's a really valuable uh, thing to use in children of a certain age, you know, at club uh, under 10, we don't use this because I think we're, we're, we need to let them experience the game for itself. I think as they get through, we can start, you know, just linking on to your point there. I don't think it's our job as coaches to link the information together for them, but I think it's our job to create practices and environments that inf- like require them to, to link them together. Mm. Um, I, you know, I mentioned it earlier, the constructs are really, are really important to consider. Um, and another coach got me thinking about this, um, a few weeks back and they were talking about how, you know, how does a player's assessment of risk and reward af- affect by the time left or the time at the moment or the score or how tired they are? How is that actually affected? How is that going to affect their assessment of a risk reward? I, at the start of a game, you actually might be more inclined to take risks because you know, there's nothing to lose. Two nil down, you're probably you might be you might be uh, two nil down. You might actually be more risk of risk taking because you know you want to score, you want to get a goal. Three nil up, you might actually say, you know, this is our time to not take risks. We're going to take a low reward because we've already got that reward. Um, fatigue, I think, is a really interesting one because um, at the start of a game, players minds are fresh versus at the end of the game where they're very emotionally involved in the game. I think that's a really important point to consider. Um, I, I think a really good way to use this approach is using it at the start and the end of a session. Yeah. Let the start keep it really low pressure. And then in the sort of last last bit of the session, increase, add in these constructs. If you've got two minutes left, you're two nil up. What, how is that going to affect their decision making? Yeah. But the key is we have to replicate these constructs in practice. We have to replicate the idea of time and score and fatigue in our practices. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was... I always see it and every coach, loads of coaches say it, is we often see like isolated technical work, which I don't disagree with at all at the start of a session when players are, have, are not tired, you know, shouldn't be tired, hopefully, yeah, depending. Yeah. depending. Yeah. Um, and we often see that. And actually that's the time where they're going to be, they're going to have the best assessment of risk and rewards. But we yeah. then have to see the difference in their assessment. And we can start to, as coaches, 
see what players think good decision making looks like at different stages. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the key with everything is getting them to analyze, you know, yeah. you know, the whole idea is that we want them to make, we want them to be aware of the environment. We want them to assess the environment. We want them to make a decision and then we want them to analyze it. Yeah. We want them to think, think about that decision and really reflect on the decisions. Um, and I think it's often something as coach, we don't do enough. And actually I really struggled as sort of a younger coach when someone went, why did you do this? Cause it often seems quite um, <laughs> an attacking phrase, but yeah. as coaches, we do it all the time. We say, why do you do that? Yeah. But it's actually, when we can see that we're trying to challenge someone to get them to reflect, it's really, really crucial. Yeah. I hope that answers about context. I think it, it, it definitely does. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I suppose your final point there really is the importance of thinking about the language you use, isn't it? But yeah, you know, I can remember reading a study, just going back to your point of, uh, you know, time in the game and stuff. I can remember reading a study about, you know, if, uh, if, if a goalkeeper is facing a penalty and, it, and, and it's nil-nil, they're more likely to stay in the middle of the goal because it's more important as if, you know, the, the, the team's 3 and up and there's, you know, 20 minutes left of the game, they're more likely to take a risk and, and go and die for the ball, which, again, such a such such a key point, actually, you've, uh, you, you've mentioned there. And, and again, fatigue, uh, you know, so important and, and such an impact on, on, you know, how players make decisions, you know, let alone uh, risk-taking behaviour. So, so, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly does uh, demonstrate the importance there. And I think that's often the message that, that we say quite a lot on this podcast, you know, remembering who you are working with, you know, what level are they at, you know, and and what is suitable for them and what isn't. So, so yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that leads us on very nicely to our uh, final segment, which we always finish on the podcast, Impl- Implications for Coaching Practice. So, you know, We've had an absolutely fantastic uh, insight from you there, Lawrence, in, in terms of how do we uh, implement this into coaching practice and, and a fantastic run through. So, you know, is there any other uh, implications as such we need to uh, think about when we're you know looking to introduce risk versus reward, uh, you know, within our practice? Is there anything that we've missed that you, you just want to add on to the podcast? Yeah, I think I'll talk a little bit. I've, I've just got loads of notes about it. So I'm just going to, I'm reading them. I'm just checking. <laughs> to see. Um, I think the important part, and I mentioned it to you, is about around decision making yeah. um, and how a practice, what what strategy, of, what form of strategy does a practice, what form of decision making does a pr- um, practice imply? Um, there are many different types of decision making. I'll touch on two because I think they're probably the two of the most relevant. For example, so you've got an intuitive decision maker who is often described actually in sports as being intuitive and it's often like fast, rational, and it's usually through rules of thumb that they've learned. So actually probably through learning about the risks and outcomes, we've then got a deliberative decision maker who's slow, rational, and puts more effort into their decision making. I think here with these two decisions, we have to design practices that account for both. Yeah. I, if I put, I've got it, I've got it behind me, I think at the moment as well. If I put a 3v3 in a really large area, I'm encouraging more deliberative decision-making because they've got time. They can think through. If I put a 3v3 in a really small area, high pressure, they've got to make quick decisions. It's got to sort of just be on the it feels right kind of intuitive things. Yeah. Um, and I think we have to, as coaches, design practices that are suited to intuitive decision-makers that force them to make er- probably higher errors, yeah. but also deliberative practices that actually give them time to think about their decisions. I think that's as you know, when a constraint can come in where we can be like, you can't, you know, actually in this, you can't tackle. You can just, you can be there to like protect, but you can't tackle because we're giving the player more time to think about it and see the alternatives and think about the outcomes and process them. And I, I think in coaching, it's, it's probably not, it's probably not considered as much about the types of decision makers we have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, go on. And with with that is you know when we think i'll sort of link it back to the context is at uh you know at youth level how much information does a player have around the out unexpected outcome i what previous experience they have where they might be aware Mm -hmm. of the outcome if there's little experience it's going to be the uncertainty phase at adult phase they've probably had a bit more experience hopefully (laughs) and they're gonna be they're gonna have more awareness of the outcomes yeah um, which is, which is, you know, it links back nicely to what we said earlier. I think it's so important that we give them a chance to experience different outcomes yeah. at all, at all, in, in all practices. I certainly, the biggest, the biggest sort of consideration for me actually is that we don't overuse this approach. Yeah. You know, I don't think the problem is if we overuse it, what happens is that actually becomes less valuable. 
Yeah. Because if every, if every session there's an opportunity to get loads of points, it doesn't become as rewarding and it doesn't feel as, you know, engaging for a player. If yeah. it's every so often and we can sort of actually get this, this buzz around it where, you know, we want the high rewards. If we use it at certain times, then it becomes more valuable and the players are more likely to demonstrate the, the risk-taking behaviours. Yeah. Um, so I definitely don't think it's, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this is the only approach we should use in every, <laughs> it's not by, by any stretch of the imagination. But the why, the, you know, that is the thing that I think about so much. At every session I design, I just write why question mark at the top yeah. of the top of the page. Um, and why am I doing this? Why am I putting these higher risks in? What is the reason? Do players see the reason? Do they not see the reason? And not just put it in and not just be like, oh, there's there's 10 points for you. And, you know, I touched on it earlier as well, that idea of it doesn't just have to be a team. It can be an individual. Yeah. Um, we can sort of, you know, target individuals through helping them and like this idea i really like this idea um of like those secret type missions where you tell a player that no one else knows and they sort of go on and they're the thing with that is then they're they're risk-taking behaviors but no one else knows yeah, yeah. So everyone's a bit like whoa yeah, yeah um but we can go through individuals we can go through teams yeah um but again the why why am i giving that player a high reward for that is it to help them develop a technique or a principle or is it to throw the other team off um and then lastly i mentioned it earlier make just ensure that it's not not focus i think often we focus constraints just on or rewards just on attack yeah. because as everyone we like looking at the ball um yeah. but i think it's really important that they, they, they work both ways so actually if the defense do something that is high risk yeah. they're going to get a high reward as well because then we're sort of we make you know i'm a big believer that there's not really such a thing as attack and defense there's just a phase that goes transition phase mm. um but we have to make sure we reward both of them because otherwise i think we we just make it less important, you know, as I'll link back to the first one I made, just value the behaviors that we want, to, that we want to see and the decisions that we want them to make, make sure we put a value on them and make sure the players understand that value, or at least as a coach, we understand the value of them. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 absolutely. Again, some, some outstanding points really. I mean, you know, I, I suppose I'll go through what I've written down, Lawrence. I, I think. Sorry, I went on a bit of a, I got on a bit of a zone then. I just, <laughs> no, no, I, just I, went. I love it. We, we always encourage it on the podcast. It's great. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think like you say, uh, you know, there's that often that saying, isn't it, that, that, that's, that's linked with like non-linear pedagogy, constraints-led approach. Uh, we have to make sure that our practice environment reflects the game environment. So, you know, going about the, you know, your point on decision-making, uh, intuitive, deliberate decisions, that's what players will experience in a game. There'll be times when it's got to be a quick decision and they've got to do it. There'll be other times where they've got lots of uh, time and space to think before they make that decision. And I think that really highlights the importance there that you know we are we are preparing the players as best as possible for that game environment so so yeah I, I think that's a great point but I, I think the the overriding point that I really like that you keep going back to is is this idea of why am I doing it I think that's such an important point that that you make you know sometimes as coaches we don't always think about the why we sort of go oh, this is fantastic what we're doing it but we don't always think but what as we were saying earlier, the bigger picture, what are we actually doing this for? What's the reason behind it? How is it going to benefit our athletes? And I think that is the key message, you know, with, with all this and actually we have a lot of other topics as well. Why are you doing it? What are we actually looking to achieve here through doing yeah. a particular uh, constraint that we're implementing? And how is that going to going to benefit our, our, our players? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's such a great point. And I, and I really like... Uh, you know, your point earlier about when, you know, you're saying that, well, I'll try and focus on two players in a session. I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I, think it, I think it's also, sorry, well, I think it's well, really interesting because I was just thinking when you were saying that because I was just thinking as coaches, you know, there are times when we make really intuitive decisions and we yeah. just do something because it feels right. But then there are also times where we sit there for like 15 minutes watching something and just really thinking and I'm, I'm yeah. thinking, what are the outcomes of my decision? It's really like, if we're doing it as coaches, the players the players need to do it as well. The players yeah. need, to, need, to under, need to understand it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, such, such a great point, actually. Uh, you know, it, it's like the other, uh, I, I suppose, similar to the work I've done on coach decision making, naturalistic decision where you just make it there in quick or, yeah. or you actually have time to uh, to think about the decision you're making. And, and you're so right, if we do that as coaches, we have to think about how we're allowing our players to uh, actually make better decisions, should we say, when, when we're looking in that environment. So, so yeah, absolutely fantastic, Lawrence. Uh, I've got to say that that's been one of my favourite conversations on the podcast out of all four series. So, uh, you know, really good job. I've, I've really yeah, enjoyed um, to you this morning. Yeah, thank you. It was, I think it's, you know, a, a really interesting topic that 
could could I think if more coaches become more aware of how to use it and why to do it, I think it can become quite a, a game changer, especially at youth level. But it was um it was really great talking, just talking all things coaching and ris- risks and rewards. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I I think it's such a such a fascinating topic. It's certainly something that, that that's on my wavelength. So I, I really enjoy uh, you know chatting and listening about it. But yeah, I, I think uh, you know you gave some really. Uh, you know, exceptional points really in, in, in terms of why we might use this approach, you know, considerations, being aware of the context, uh, you know, being aware of, of, of when and, and when it's appropriate to do this, like you say, you know, not always using it because it might not always be appropriate. So, so yeah, I, I, I thought that was a fan, fantastic episode, really, uh, really interesting insight into, into the idea of risk and reward. I, I've, I've certainly learned a lot today, which is, uh, which is always beneficial for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Lawrence, I, I guess, you know, for, for people listening, if they want to, you know, uh, you know, follow you, see the the fantastic work you're doing, or get in, get in touch, make that connection, maybe even, you know, have a little bit of a conversation on this. Uh, what would be the best way to find you on social media? Probably the old coaching Twitter, isn't it? <laughs> oh, the old coaching Twitter. Yeah, like always, always up for talking, coaching, anything. You know, I think as coaches, the best thing for us to do is keep talking, just keep developing, and that was sort of my my biggest resolution this year was just to connect with loads of coaches and just have conversations. I think. Yeah. You know, as coaches, sometimes we disagree with with other coaches' perceptions, but I think we can always take something from someone. Um, you're going to find you're naturally going to find coaches that are similar to you and just are on the same wavelength. But it's really good actually when you connect with the coaches that aren't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what is my Twitter? My Twitter, because my name wasn't available, is Lawrence Mead <laughs> with an underscore with an underscore at the end. So yeah, um, definitely. Uh, I just love talking coaching and always keen to talk risk reward. I think there's probably a, there's probably so much more out there about it as well. There's probably a lot, a lot that I, even I haven't considered that hopefully as time, time progresses, I'll, I'll start to see. No, certainly. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're always learning, aren't we? But, but Lawrence, I've, I've got to say, I thought you did an outstanding job talking about this topic today. Uh, I've, I've, like I said, I've, I've, I've learned a lot and, and really enjoyed it. So, uh, I've got to thank you. Did you enjoy your first podcast appearance or you've you done them before? Or always, always, always enjoy it. Yeah, no, it's been good. No, I've not done one before. So it's a, it's an interesting experience, especially <laughs> over, over Zoom. But yeah, hopefully I did all right. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, you, you did really good for your first one. So, uh, so kudos to you, Lawrence. Uh, so yeah, Lawrence, it, it just seems to say thank you uh, so much for your time. Uh, again, you know, not many coaches want to chat with me on a, on a Sunday morning. So uh, you know, I, I certainly appreciate that. It's, uh, it's been great to connect with you. And as always, thank you uh, to all our, our listeners listening to the podcast today, whether you're listening on, uh, you know, any of our uh, audio platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, if, if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, but I'd certainly encourage you to, uh, to check out our YouTube channel uh, if you prefer to see me and Lawrence talking in person. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for listening. Please do uh, leave us a review, let you know what you think. You know, any questions, please do feel free to get in touch with myself or get in touch with Lawrence. And uh, yeah. Hope you enjoyed the episode and hopefully we will uh, see you all next week.